The Saturday morning men's group from St. Michael's is offering the St. Pope John Paul II versions of the Stations of the Cross tonight. <clears throat> we'll be adding a visual description of the sketch in the booklet. Since this version differs slightly from the traditional stations, and as well as not having the same statues. Pope John Paul wrote on the Christian meaning of human suffering that we gradually hear Christ's answer to the question of the why of human suffering as we become shearers ourselves in the suffering of Christ. Let us all stand and join in singing number 128, led by the Spirit, number 128. Just a quick note where it says kneel, we're not going to kneel tonight, so just ignore the instruction in the booklet, kneel. The first station, the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Olives. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have saved the world. In darkness under a large olive tree, Jesus prayed. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be troubled and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch. He advanced a little and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. Jesus felt sorrow and dread over what lay ahead of him. He prayed for the burden to be lifted and the cross to be removed, but only if the Father willed it so. When Christ saw clearly that he must drink of the bitter cup, then our Lord totally accepted his future. Not my will, but thine be done. His example teaches us how to pray at all times especially in the midst of our own crosses and cups of suffering.
the second station, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Out of the holy cross, you have saved the world. Swords drawn, fists clenched, hands embraced, then grabbing to arrest. Judas, one of the twelve, arrived accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal to them by saying, the man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him and lead him away securely. He came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. At this they laid hands on him and arrested him. Rejection always hurts. It tears at our self-esteem and leaves us doubting our own worth. Even the turning down of a simple invitation can wound us. Betrayal, especially by a friend, hurts even more. Jesus had prayed all night before selecting his 12 apostle, apostles, including Judas. Judas had also been his companion for three years, hearing the Lord's words and observing his miraculous deeds. Now he betrays his Savior with a kiss and for but a few dollars. Remembering Jesus' hurt and pain in the garden can help us deal with those times when we feel rejected and betrayed. The third station, the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin condemns Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have saved the world. A person pointing with accusation and blame. The chief priests and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death but they found none. The high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, and he said to him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? Envy and jealousy can be like cancerous diseases within us. They spread throughout our whole being, leading to uncharitable conversations, false accusations, and other destructive actions. We see all of this played out among the religious leaders of Jesus' time as they condemn Christ without basis. Our Lord offers a model for us. He did not, intent, he did not defend himself, but remained silent before the false accusations. Jesus did, however, assert himself, speaking the truth, regardless of the cost.
the fourth station, Peter denies Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because God. by your holy cross, Jesus. you have saved the world. The sight and sound of the crowing rooster acknowledging Peter's denial. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's maids came along. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked intently at him and said, you too were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So he went out into the outer court. Then the cock crowed. The maid saw him and began to say to bystanders, this man is one of them. Once again, he denied it. A little later, the bystanders said to Peter once more, surely you are one of them, for you too are a Galilean. He began to curse and swear, I do not know this man about who you are talking. And immediately a cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. All of us are like Peter to an extent, willing but weak. We make resolutions but don't keep them. We try to start a new life but slip back again into a way of darkness. Yet, weak as Peter was, not only at Jesus' trial, but at other times as well, he truly loved Jesus. In fact, it was his love that repeatedly set him up for failure. All of Christ's other followers ran away after his arrest. Peter, however, followed along into the courtyard, only there to see his weakness take over. Almost immediately, he wept because of what he had done. A few short days afterward, Jesus would take this weak but loving follower and make him head of the church, supplying him with divine strength to overcome his human weakness. The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will receive my prayer. The fifth station, Pilate condemns Jesus to the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by, because by your holy cross, cross you have saved the world. Distorted, angry faces shouting, crucify him, crucify him. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes, that is the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Now on the occasion of the feast, he used to release to them one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison, along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, then what do you want me to do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again, crucify him. Pilate said to him, why? 
What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. Pilate seemed anxious to release Jesus, almost looking for a way to do so, but the crowd would not allow that. Pilate capitulated, fearing for his future and lacking the courage to do what was right. We have, on occasion, acted similarly. Out of depths I call to you, Lord. Lord, hear my cry. May your ears be attentive to your cry of mercy. If you, Lord, keep count of sins, Lord, who can stand? But if you is forgiveness, The sixth station, Jesus is scourged and crowned with thorns. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your, by your holy cross, cross you have saved the world. <clears throat> Long vines with sharp thorns braided into a crown. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Pilate had Jesus scourged, a truly cruel punishment. He was probably stripped to the waist and made to bend over a short pillar. Then he was lashed several dozen times with a whip, the first few of those strokes cutting open the skin on his back. After the scourging, a wooden band or crown of long, sharp thorns was pressed into his scalp. The pain had to be excruciating. When our own head hurts, or we suffer some other bodily pain, it would do it well for us to follow the advice in the letter to the Hebrews. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. For the sake of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and I hope for his word. My soul looks for the Lord, more than sentinels for daybreak. The seventh station. Jesus is mocked by the soldiers and given his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross you have saved the world. Men heavily clad in armor mock Jesus and his kingship. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the praetorium, and assembled the whole cohort. They began to salute him and kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him. They knelt before him in homage, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. He deserves our praise and reverence. 
Yet the soldiers placed upon him a dirty cloak instead of a royal garment. They handed him a thin reed instead of the golden staff used by kings. Through all this humiliation, Jesus remained silent. How different with us, though not as pure, as important as Christ, we nevertheless become angry and defensive when someone attacks or criticizes us in any way. More than sentinels for daybreak, let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is mercy, with him is contentious redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all its sins. The eighth station. Simon the Cyrenian helps Jesus carry his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because, because by your, your holy, holy cross, cross you have, have saved, saved the, world. the world. The hand of Simon the Cyrenian feels for a place on the thick wooden beam to help lift the cross. They pressed into service a passerby, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Those in charge of Jesus' crucifixion compelled Simon of Cyrene to help carry the Lord's cross. He did not volunteer or willingly accept the task, but that is no surprise. Simon was only passing by and presumably, presumably knew little about Christ. We, on the other hand, do know Jesus. And we have heard his words about the necessity of taking up our own crosses each day and walking in his footsteps. What is our response? Must we be pressed to carry our crosses, be they big or small, or do we accept them willingly. Because I kept silent, my bones wasted away. I groaned all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength withered as in dry summer heat. Then I declared my sin to you. My guilt I did not hide. I said, I confess my transgression to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. The ninth station, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by, by your, your holy cross, cross you have saved, saved the world. Faces of women, veiled, mourning, and weeping. A large crowd of people followed Jesus, including many women who mourned and lamented him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. Compassion means, literally, to suffer with someone. Empathy means to feel with them. These women displayed both qualities as they accompanied Jesus, so bruised and disfigured, on this sorrowful journey through the streets of Jerusalem. We imitate their example when we listen with love to another's troubles, hold another's hand by a hospital bed, or embrace another who is grieving. Lord, do not punish me in your anger. 
In your wrath, do not chastise me. Your arrows have sunk deep in me. Your hand has come down upon me. The tenth station, Jesus is crucified. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. Because by your holy cross you have saved the world. The hand of Jesus is nailed to the woman, wooden beam with a metal stake. They brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine drugged with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. First, they drove nails through his hands and feet. Then they raised him on the cross where he hung painfully for three hours, an example of patience for all to study. St. John the 23rd had a crucifix on his bedroom wall. He prayed in front of it before retiring upon arising and whenever cares awakened him during the night. A cross, he said, is the primary symbol of God's love for us. My Lord, my deepest yearning is before you. My groaning is not hidden from you. My heart shudders. My strength forsakes me. The very light of my eyes has failed. Friends and companions shun my disease. My neighbors stand far off. The 11th station, Jesus promises paradise to the penitent criminal. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. The fingers of Jesus' nailed hand reaching out to the repentant thief. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals there, one on his right, the other on his left. Now one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly, for the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes, but this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to them, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One criminal said no to Christ, the other yes. To his penitent companion on Calvary, Jesus promised immediate forgiveness and entrance into heaven. When we doubt God's willingness to forgive us, when we keep punishing ourselves for past mistakes, when we dread the thought of standing before the pure Christ with our not-so-pure lives, we might recall this scene on the cross and draw hope from it. Have mercy on me, God, in accord with your merciful love. In your abundant compassion, blot out my transgressions. Thoroughly wash away my guilt, and from my sin cleanse me. You will let me hear gladness and joy. All the flesh will rejoice. The 
12th station, Jesus speaks to his mother and to his disciple. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have saved the world. Hands embracing and holding each other. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the, to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. With these words, Jesus gives his mother to us, making her our mother as well. Mary becomes the mother of the church. We can rely upon her for help and look to her as a model. Here she stands at the foot of the cross, offering her son for us and for the whole world. She reminds us that if we unite our sufferings, both large and small, with her son on the cross and with her at the foot of the cross, we will share in Christ's work of bringing grace and blessings to others. Hasten to answer me, Lord, Lord, for my, my spirit, spirit fails me. me. Do not hide your face from me, lest I become like those descending to the pit. In the morning, let me hear of your mercies, for in you I trust. Show me the path I should walk, for I entrust my life to you. Jesus gives to The thirteenth station, Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. The silhouette of three crosses on the hill of Calvary. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Allah, Allah, lemma sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry, and breathed his last. Indeed, let us kneel for a moment in prayerful remembrance. Jesus, as a faithful Jew, would have prayed the Psalms regularly. It is no surprise then that these words from Psalm 22 are on his lips during the intense agony of his last moments. While this cry might seem to be a sign of despair or hopelessness, it reveals rather the depth of his anguish and the intensity of his pain. Shortly afterward, he surrenders totally to his father's will. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. We might wish to follow Christ's example, letting these words be the last on our lips as we wait each night for sleep to come, sleep which is a symbol of our own eventual death.
the 14th station, the burial of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have saved the world. Stairs leading down to the tomb where Jesus was buried. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council, who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having bought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Starting on Good Friday, the church enters into a brief period of silent grief, a time of mourning that looks with hope to the joy of the resurrection that will be proclaimed and celebrated at the Easter Vigil. We grieve in much the same way when someone we love dies. There are tears and sorrow, of course, but rays of hope and belief in a later reunion bring us comfort, understanding, and strength. The 15th station, Jesus rises from the dead. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you. By your holy cross, you have saved the world. An angel, a sign of God's presence. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early, when the sun had risen, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, Who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. After the cross comes the crown. After three days of mourning and waiting, the church celebrates Jesus' resurrection. He is victorious. The light of the world has conquered darkness. The way, the truth, and the life have overcome death. We hear Jesus' words, peace be with you. We feel, in our, we feel joy in our hearts. We sing again that acclamation of praise, Alleluia. His triumph is ours as well. On Easter Sunday, and in the many other Easter's of our lives, we rise above our failures, our burdens, and our struggles. We too emerge victorious. Throughout our own Good Fridays, the risen Lord is by our side, pledging that we too will rise again, both here on earth 
and hereafter in the life yet to come. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. Sing praise to my God while I live. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord shall reign forever. You are God's son through all generations. Closing hymn is number 717, Lift High at the Cross, number 717. 